My bedroom is on the second floor of the house. There is no patio, porch, or overhang of any kind beneath my windows. A couple of years ago, I was watching TV in bed around 2 a.m. and heard a louder than usual animal sound. Not uncommon to hear squirrels running around on the roof from time to time. Didn't think much of it. It kept on happening and started to sound awfully close to the window and not on the roof. I ignored it for a pretty long time. After at least 40 to 45 minutes of being irritated by the noise, I banged on the wall in hopes of scaring them off until I could get to sleep. Just two quick bangs with my fist, which were answered with two bangs on the wall right next to the window from outside. Needless to say, I about had a heart attack and jumped out of bed. Now, my living room has a bay window and is on the other end of the house, so I could look out that window from the side and see my bedroom window. I hustle downstairs and peek out, and I see a guy standing in front of my house below my bedroom window, and he's holding a knife, and he's petting the front of my house. I call the police and wait. He never leaves my bedroom window, and even when they roll up and ultimately disarm and arrest him, he doesn't struggle at all. Not me specifically, but my mother used to work at a hotel in Washington, D.C. back in the 90s as a housekeeper or a maid. She needed money because she was a refugee from Vietnam. Even though she didn't know much English at the time, she knew enough to get by at her job and all the other staff and hotel guests loved her because of how sweet she was. Because of this, any time high-profile guests, such as the Backstreet Boys, would stay at the hotel, the manager always sent my mom to clean the room since she was very good at it. One day, a guest came. We'll refer to him as Mr. M, because I don't know his real name. He checked into their most expensive suite. As usual, the manager told my mom to take care of the room. As she got there, there was a do not disturb sign, so she told the manager she would come back later. What was weird was that no one was ever allowed in his room. The man stayed there for over a month, and not one time did he let staff come in to clean. However, he paid a lot and gave a warm welcome every time he passed a staff member, so no one paid him any attention. Then one day, people didn't see him anymore, so they assumed he checked out, even though the receptionist had no account of this. Since it had been so long since the room was cleaned, and the do not disturb sign wasn't on the door anymore, the manager told my mom to go check it out and try to clean up what she could. As she got to the floor and unlocked the door to the room, a very disturbing smell hit her. She couldn't figure out what it was, but she continued to survey the room, which was disgustingly messy. Her words were that it looked like someone had thrown a rave, even though no other guests seemed to have ever gone into the room, besides Mr. M. It looked like Mr. M had deserted the place without telling anyone. My mom was still shocked by the smell, so she tried to track it down. As she followed the smell, she could tell that it was coming from the hotel room closet. When she opened the closet, there was nothing but a cardboard box on the ground from which the smell was resonating. My mother's first instinct was to open the box to see what it was and to throw it away. When she opened the box, what she saw scarred her to this day. It was the rotting, decomposing head of a young woman, chopped off. My mother immediately screamed and got out of there, where she fainted in the elevator. When she woke up, cops were everywhere, and the hotel was a CSI scene. The manager told her that Mr. M wasn't his real name, and he used a fake credit card to check in. The head of the woman was identified to be like a call girl or prostitute. 
I don't know how much more or any nitty gritty details. Needless to say, my mom quit that day. We moved into a new house a few months ago. As we were in the process of purchasing the house, the renter who was living in it died unexpectedly of natural causes in his mid-forties. He died right in the middle of the living room. Shortly after, we move into the house and almost immediately our two-year-old daughter starts talking about the ghost that lives in our house. Now, let's be real here. She is two and two-year-olds are very impressionable. Halloween had recently passed, and she had this Halloween-themed picture book that she loved to read, so it's entirely possible that all this talk of ghosts was just coming from looking through that book on a regular basis. Still, she was always telling me that the ghost was in her playhouse in the basement, or that the ghost was on the stairs, or that the ghost was standing in the corner. She never seemed to be afraid of the ghost and considered him to be her friend, so I wasn't all that concerned even if there really was a ghost haunting our house. If he's a nice and helpful ghost, it could certainly be a lot worse. I would often tell the ghost that he was welcome to stay if he wanted, but he was also welcome to go if that would make him happier. I didn't believe ghosts were real, and she supposedly could see and talk to him versus the ghost being just her imagination fueled by her Halloween book. Until one day, when we were going out to the car to go to daycare in the morning, it was still dark out and raining. My daughter told me that the ghost was on the back deck, and then she told me that today was the ghost's birthday, and she wanted to sing him happy birthday. Once again, I mostly disregarded what she was saying, as she is birthday obsessed and has in the past made us sing happy birthday to Mickey Mouse, a bowl of fruit snacks, and the bathroom. So we sang and wished the ghost a happy birthday and went on with our lives. Later that day, out of pure curiosity, I looked up the obituary of the man who had died in our house, and wouldn't you know it, it was his birthday. I lived in an apartment a few years ago. Four units upstairs, four units downstairs. I lived upstairs, and the apartment below me was vacant. I kept hearing footsteps through the apartment, and I knew that I shouldn't have. Nobody was down there. I asked someone to come over and listen, just to see if I was being crazy. Maybe I'm just hearing other apartments, since it is vacant downstairs and everything is kind of echoing. Wrong. I kept hearing the footsteps. This went on for a solid hour. Finally, I called the landlord and the police. Apparently, someone had broken in through the windows downstairs and was walking back and forth through the apartment with a knife. It was horrifying. I drove past a car on my way to class and college. I always took the back roads to avoid traffic, so it was a bit odd to have a car parked on the side of the road. When I came back from class, it was still there. I drove by a bit more slowly, and saw what I thought was someone sleeping in there. I thought that was odder still, but maybe someone was traveling and decided to pull off to take a rest, and just fell asleep longer than they had planned. Nope. Next morning I read in the paper, a wife killed her husband and dumped his body and the car on that road. I was out in the middle of nowhere at a musical conference my wife was presenting held at an old church retreat camp. One of her presentations ran way over so the lodge's cafeteria was closed. With no car, no phone, and no vending machines, the only resort was to walk into the nearest town and get food. 
I grabbed a coat and flashlight and had no issue on the trip down and snagged a pizza from a spot along the highway around midnight. On the way back, it was a different story. I had a severe feeling of discomfort. I could feel eyes watching me. This was out in the middle of the woods, so my first instinct is there's an animal following me. Knowing most predators like to hit from either above or behind, I turned on my phone light and kept it pointed behind me and swept my flashlight up and down as I walked. The whole walk back I heard rustlings, first along one side, then following behind. I kept a steady pace and acted cool, even though I was terrified. Shortly before I was back on sight, the feeling left. No more sounds. My wife and I enjoyed the pizza and slept in. Two days later, we got a shock from the news. A homeless woman was found less than 1,500 yards from our site and had been mauled and partially consumed in what appeared to be a cougar attack. Estimates of the time of death were the exact time that I was walking back with the pizza. My friend and I carpool to and from work together every day. It was late at night, and I was waiting for her to come pick me up, when her cousin drove past and told me she was running late, and had asked if he could come pick me up, so I wouldn't have to wait so long alone. I met her cousin only once, very briefly at a wedding she had dragged me to a few months back. He seemed nice, then and now, so I agreed. I was about to step into the car, but then I realized I had left my purse inside my work. I told him I would be two seconds and I was going to go grab it. I went back into work and grabbed my purse. My phone rang. It was my friend. She said she was on her way to come pick me up. Confused, I reminded her that she had asked her cousin to pick me up. Silence. She only had one cousin, and he was on a missionary trip in another country. What the hell? Turns out, this guy had been memorizing every detail of my life and schedule, and knew I waited for my friend every night to pick me up. He dressed up as my friend's cousin because he knew I wouldn't be afraid of him because I had met him, but I don't know him well enough to realize that it wasn't him. The cops, after a long chase, caught him. He had previously murdered three other women, and in the back of his car were poisons, guns, chains, knives, ropes, and various masks. I got into the elevator from the top floor to head down one day. The lift stopped at the fourth floor, and the door opened. I saw people outside standing still, making no attempt to come in, despite me being alone inside, and there was room for them. The automatic elevator door then closed, and right before it completely shut, I heard someone outside say, Why are there so many people on the elevator? My uncle just got married. For their honeymoon, he and his wife and her daughter went to stay in a cabin on Big Bear Mountain in Southern California. They rented the cabin, unpacked all their stuff, and settled in for a three-day stay. On the last night, my uncle was up watching TV very late. His wife and stepdaughter had gone to bed, and he had to use the restroom. So he gets up, goes to the restroom, does his business, and then exits. The only light on in the whole cabin is that from the TV in the living room, but it was bright enough to light the whole living room and part of the hallway. As he opened the door to the restroom, he saw his wife walk down towards the kitchen. He figured she had gotten up and was hungry, so he was going to go talk to her. He followed after her, and when she reached the end of the hallway, she turned slightly in the direction of the kitchen and then at warp speed, walked, ran, or vaulted out into the kitchen, faster than a human could move. 
This figure was wearing a long flowing white gown similar to the one his wife had worn to bed. Creeped out, he took a few steps back and peeked into the room, and found them both in bed, still asleep. Needless to say, he couldn't sleep after that, and they left the next morning. Several years ago, my college roommate, let's call her E, worked as the night manager for a newly built hotel. As was par for the course, I would often bring coffee in around 1 to 2 a.m. and chat for a while. One night, I showed up to find E sitting at the front desk shaking her head, looking completely perplexed. Allegedly, she had just checked in what could only be described as the doppelganger of our other roommate, M, who was alike down to the same height, hairstyle, eye color, and southern accent. E tried to speak with the new guest, and showed her a picture of M on her phone, but was rebuffed several times. We both chalked it up to a coincidence, as we knew M was visiting her parents, and we went to enjoy our coffee. Shortly after two, I decided to head home. It wasn't until around 2.30 when I pulled into our garage that I checked my phone to see a series of texts from E to M and me at 2.17 a.m. Stop. Not funny. You guys suck. Naturally, I was confused at these texts and called her back. This is when things got weird and E sounded hysterical on the phone. Apparently, M and I had been standing at the end of the main hallway staring at her. E thought this was a joke and kept calling out, but got no response from us. Eventually, the front desk phone rang, and in the time it took to answer it, we both disappeared. I calmed her down over the phone, and the next morning we talked through the possibilities, trying to rationalize what she saw. The guest who looked like M did come back to the front desk later that morning to inquire about some services, and much to E's surprise, looked only vaguely similar to our roommate. The only thing that scares me to this day, and that I never told her, is that when I got into our house, the kitchen clock was stuck on 217, and directly next to it sat a photo of M and I, Still no explanations and nothing weird ever happened at the hotel again. But it still makes me uneasy to this day when I think about it. I worked as a waiter in an old hotel in Scotland that was reputedly haunted. The restaurant and the part with the bedrooms were separate buildings and all on the ground floor. One afternoon, we were expecting two elderly sisters to check in for a few nights. Friends of the owner and regular guests, though being a newish member of staff, I had not met them yet. Well, one of the other waiters mentioned that they had arrived and asked if I would go put a bottle of wine in their room while they were being helped out of their car. I picked up the bottle, opened it, got two glasses and a tray, and nipped out the back of the restaurant, across the courtyard, past the two old ladies getting out of their car, and into the main building. I turned into the corridor leading to the bedrooms. Now, at this point I knew there was nobody else in the building, no other guests, and only the owner and a couple of waiters were around between lunch and dinner service. I had also been told the stories about the hotel ghost. Apparently, an old woman in grey who had hanged herself when it was a coaching inn. I was therefore perturbed to see a headless figure in faded Victorian dress shuffling away from me down the corridor in complete silence. I used to work in my aunt and uncle's hotel in a Scottish village about twelve years ago and the scariest thing that happened to me was one night when I was sleeping in the staff quarters and heard a banging noise from along the corridor. 
This was about 3 a.m. after most of the staff had gone to bed. I got up to go and tell whoever was coming in late to shut the hell up so I could go back to sleep. But the corridor was empty. Well lit, I have to add. This is key. So I walk down to the end of the corridor to see if it's people coming up the stairs drunk or whatever. I look down to see a figure stomping up the stairs. The only way I can describe it is as though a shadow of a person was solid. There were no features on the face or clothes on its body. Imagine someone in a black morph suit walking along, but you could see things through them. I turned and ran back to my room and shut the door. I could still hear them stomping for some time, and I don't think I got a wink of sleep at all that night. I didn't leave my room until the sun was shining through my window. I asked a few of the other staff if they heard the stomping the night before, but nobody else did, and I never mentioned seeing somebody coming up the stairs. I was typing up an email to a customer and saw something out of the corner of my eye. I ignored it for a moment and kept working. Then it sunk in. It was a person staring at me through the window. As I turned my head, they slowly walked out of my view towards the parking lot. So I hauled ass outside to confront them, but they were gone. Not a soul in sight for miles. I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched for the rest of the night. I need to use the restroom while driving one day, so I pull off at a gas station and roll up to the empty lot across the street. I was in the town of Kent, which was abandoned. I walk up to the bush line and notice a makeshift fire pit. The wood is somewhat burned, but not all the way. The weird thing is that there is an unscathed dollar bill stuck in the wood. For a second, I was about to grab it, but then this sinister feeling came over me, so I decided not to touch it and finished peeing in the bush. As I'm walking back, I look over at it, and I have a really negative feeling. I look to the ground in front of me, and right in front of me, looking up at me, is a rattlesnake. I stop dead in my tracks, and walk very slowly and carefully around it, while it stares at me the whole time. I ran as fast as I could back to my truck, feeling like somebody was right behind me the whole time. I kicked up a lot of dust getting out of there, and have never stopped in Kent since. I was driving north through the mountains of Colorado towards Pueblo, and this was my first time dealing with anything like the Rocky Mountains, so I was taking it nice and slow, with my hazards on and in the right lane. This was in the spring, and there wasn't much snow on the ground aside from a light dusting. I remember passing another truck that was pulled to the shoulder on my way up. Nothing out of the ordinary. However. As I was heading down the mountain, which can be extremely scary in an 18-wheeler, trust me, I saw the same truck I passed earlier fly by me in the left lane. Now being passed on the left going downhill in the Rocky Mountains by another tractor trailer is crazy enough, but what really makes this story is this guy's trailer brakes were on fire. He was pulling a load and if you know anything about trucks, you know there's only so much braking you're supposed to do before they overheat, and worst case, catch on fire. This guy's truck looked like a comet as he sped down the mountain at what I thought was surely to be a deadly pace. I grabbed the mic to the radio and called out to him, Hey, driver, your brakes are on fire. I mean literally on fire. After a few seconds of static, a rough and weathered sounding voice comes back over the speaker of my radio and says, cool as a cucumber, 
I know. And he disappeared around a curve. I never saw any wrecked truck, emergency crews, or even mention of an accident over the radio. I did see a discarded fire extinguisher on the ground at the base of the mountain, though. I was on vacation in Ithaca with my boyfriend at the time. We had literally, I'm talking ten minutes, just gotten into town and stopped at a suspension bridge near Cornell's campus. I'm terrified of heights, so my boyfriend was coaxing me step by step over the bridge. It was gorgeous, and we stopped at the middle to take a picture. On the side we had come from, there was a parking lot with steps leading to the bottom of the gorge, but on the far side, there were hiking paths with no barrier. A woman walked past us and offered to take a picture for us. We declined, and she smiled and walked quickly to the far side of the bridge, where she smoothly jumped off into the gorge. There was not a second of hesitation. It was almost like she expected the path to keep going. Driving to pick up a friend who was at this cabin party about 40 miles west of where I lived. It was close to 2 a.m., so I'm driving down this back road to find this random cabin somewhere, and I come across this red four-door sedan with all the doors open and four limp figures in the seats with their heads slumped over. That alone scared the hell out of me. Later on, I'm driving by again after a failed attempt at picking up my friend. Mind you, it's getting close to 3 in the morning, and only the front seat passenger door was open, and every person in that car was staring with a blank dead stare directly at me as I drove past at 10 miles per hour. The wife and I had been married roughly two years at the time. About two months after we were married, she started having problems. Mood swings, anxiety, irritability, that sort of thing. But we were working opposite schedules at the time, so I was pretty irritable too. Well, her anxiety got worse and started a beautiful friendship with paranoia. Eventually, she wasn't able to work anymore. She got to the point where she couldn't even leave the house most days. She required more time and effort to care for. Things were pretty intense for a couple in their 20s. We tried doctors, but weren't getting much response from them. Mostly wait and see kind of thing. She kept getting worse, and things got harder for us. By this point, I had been forced to quit my job so that I could keep an eye on her full time. I went to college taking courses online so I could make sure she stayed safe. Student loans basically sustained us for a while. We moved in with her mom and sister so that they could take turns watching over her. Anyway, after a couple of major depressive spouts, some self-harm, and a suicide attempt or two, the doctors decided they should be dosing her up. They tried putting her on a bunch of different medications. Some made her numb. Some made her heart race so badly that we ended up in the ER. One of the medications ended up making her extremely violent. She would lash out at me, bite me, scream insults and such. A couple of times, I had to physically restrain her to keep her from hurting me, and I was the only one in the house that she would listen to, even in the slightest, when her brain was misfiring. As you can imagine, I try to sleep when she sleeps. Usually I'm a really light sleeper, and I wake up whenever she makes an unusual noise or rolls over on the bed. But sometimes I have schoolwork due, and the only time to finish it is when she's sleeping. So eventually, I'd get a decent amount of sleep lag, crawl into bed, and sleep heavily. Then, suddenly, I'm awake. There's something wrong. 
the wife isn't in bed next to me. I realize that there's more light in the room than normal. The door is slightly ajar, and light is coming in from the hallway. She's standing at the foot of the bed, holding a big kitchen knife. We'd been locking up the sharp implements, so at the time, I don't know how she got it, and she's mumbling very quietly to herself. I strain my ears, and she's arguing with herself about the merits of killing me versus leaving me alive. They were nonsensical, but mostly ran along the lines of, He stops me from doing what I want, hurting people and killing myself. Those were the cons. And then, There's no one else I can talk to. There's no one else I can talk to. And that was pretty much the whole of her debate. So you can imagine how I'm feeling at this point. Scared. Terrified. Exhausted. I had been dealing with such a high stress level for so long that I had started hallucinating that she had called for me when she hadn't. And I'm just at the point where I turn into a 17-year-old girl and I just can't take it anymore. I look at her and tell her, Take my life if you want. It's yours already. I gave it to you when we got married. And then I roll over and pretend to fall asleep. Of course I'm straining my ears for any sound to warn me I might lose my spleen. But after a moment, she crawls into bed, puts the knife under her pillow, and falls asleep. Once she started snoring, I carefully pulled the knife from under her pillow and returned it to one of the locked drawers in the kitchen. Then, I took five minutes to shake like a leaf as the adrenaline wears off, and then another ten to cry silently on the couch. Then, I crawled back into bed, wrapped my arms around her, and fell asleep. To this day, she does not remember that incident at all. I once woke up in the middle of the night and thought I felt someone holding on to my foot, which was sticking out of the covers. I looked over, but didn't see anyone, so I went back to sleep. A little while later I woke up again, with a distinct feeling that someone was touching my foot. I didn't see anyone again and thought to myself, maybe I should get up and turn on the light. But then, out of the darkness I hear a voice say, The light is burned out. In my half-dazed stupor, I accepted that and went back to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, I thought, that was a really weird dream, and reached over to turn on the light. It sparked and made a loud popping sound and burned out. I realized whoever was in my room had been right. I woke up at about 3 a.m. to the back door opening. I was in a panic and couldn't hear properly over my boyfriend's snoring. I thought I could hear quiet footsteps. Then, I heard the lounge room door open and all of this noise. I tried to wake my boyfriend up quietly by nudging him and shaking him, but he wouldn't wake up. I knew I had to get up myself and look. I dialed emergency on my phone, ready to hit send as soon as I saw someone and quietly opened the bedroom door. The lounge room door was only open a little bit. I turned my phone light on and kicked the door open. There stood my dog, totally stunned. He had a shortbread cookie in his mouth and a ripped plastic bag with more cookies at his feet. He clearly did not expect to be caught on his snack run. I worked as an assistant in the morgue. As a med student, I got to open and study the bodies that people donated to the university. All the bodies were stored in a giant walk-in freezer. Also, 
the morgue had a motion sensor system inside the freezer, so if you get stuck inside, an alarm would activate and someone would come help you. One time I was working alone because my teacher was doing some paperwork in his office that was in an adjacent building. I heard a lot of noise, but I thought it was my teacher in the other building or something like that, when suddenly the alarm goes off, scaring the hell out of me. In that moment, I thought the teacher was stuck inside the freezer, and when I was running to the freezer, my teacher grabbed my arm and told me, I thought you were in the freezer. In that moment, we stayed there staring at the door until he stopped the alarm and opened it. I was behind him with a broom, waiting for the worst. When he opened the freezer, we didn't find anything that could activate the motion sensor. There wasn't anybody, at least not alive. We decided that it was enough for the day, and we left the morgue early. So my major has a computer lab that has two stories underground. I have spent countless hours using these computers, and I have spent nights down in what us students call the dungeon. One night, around 2 a.m., I went down the hall to go get some water. The lights use motion sensors. I was filling my water bottle. The last light turned on at the end of the hall, so there was this dark gap between me and this last light way down at the end of the hall. I was mildly creeped out, but then I saw somebody walking in the darkness towards me between me and the light. I immediately ran out of the building and went home. I used to be a night janitor in a movie theater. We would go in at 4 a.m. and clean until the doors opened at 11 a.m. To save time, we would sometimes come in around the time the last movies were finishing and just sleep in one of the empty theaters, making sure we would be there when the shift started. Our basic M.O. was to use electric leaf blowers up and down the aisles of each theater, blowing popcorn and trash all the way to the bottom, then cleaning the seats up manually for anything gross or larger debris. This was expedient, but it was very loud, so it was easy to lose yourself in the work. Of course, the lights were on in the theaters to better assist in the cleaning, and usually, we were the only ones there at the time. So whenever something strange happened, we would chalk it up to the other guy. There was one standing rule, though, that we all followed to the letter. No one in the projection booth... There was no reason to go up there. We didn't clean it. All our supplies were downstairs. And most of all, it was haunted. There is a phenomenon that happens with theaters and projection booths. No matter what, you always feel like you're being watched. When you're walking around deaf from the sound of the blowers in an empty movie theater and you happen to glance up at the booth, There is always unmistakably someone standing there watching you. Especially when you both go to either end of the building to the two exits of the booth and trap whoever it was up there. And there's no one there. We just don't mess with it. We all know to not go up there. I worked overnight as a master control operator in my youth. One night, around 3 a.m., I catch sight on the camera we have aimed at the back door, and there's someone standing there wearing a scream mask, staring at the camera and not moving. I go to the back door, which is magnetically sealed and deadbolted for overnight. The door is next to impossible to force open. I look out the peephole, and there's no one there. I head back to the control and see them walk back into frame, wave at the camera, and then walk away. I called the police, but they didn't find anything, and the camera doesn't record. It's live feed only.
My first night in the mental institution, the guy I shared a room with introduced himself to me, and we made a bit of small talk. Eventually he asked me if I'd like to see something cool. Of course, I said. So he takes a light bulb out of the ceiling, lets it cool for a minute, and breaks it on the table. Right now, I'm thinking this is going to be awesome. He's going to do some MacGyver stuff right here with the wire on the inside of it. Lo and behold, he broke off a rather large shard of glass instead. He proceeded to stab and rip open his arm, all the while laughing hysterically. It was a bad experience. I lived in an old farmhouse that was over 150 years old in the 1990s and at some point had been used as a headquarters for Union troops in Northern Virginia. Lots of creepy things happened there, but this is the scariest story I have. The house had a stone cellar divided into two rooms and it always made me uncomfortable going down there to get anything for my parents. One day, I was asked to go find some menial object that was in the cellar, and I knew it would be in the room with the boiler in it, the room that also had a dysfunctional light. So I made my way into the basement, and the light wouldn't turn on, but the object I needed was within the frame of light reaching into the blackness of the room through the doorway. So I walked a few steps into the room, grabbed the object, and randomly glanced around. In the corner of the room was a dark shadow about six feet tall and humanoid in shape. It scared me at first, but then I remembered my dad kept his six-foot-tall John Wayne cutout in the basement, so that had to be it. I calmly turned to my left and nearly jumped out of my damn skin as I came face to face with John Wayne just inside the doorway and leaning against the wall. I spun around and stared into the empty corner where the dark shadow had just been standing moments before. I sprinted out of that cellar and refused to go down into the basement for at least a month after that happened. I was annoying my mother when I was around seven years old. I kept pestering her for something which I couldn't remember now, probably something stupid. Then her demeanor changed. Her expression was of a different person, and she became very still. I asked her what was wrong, and she replied, You have ten seconds to run. You have made me very, very angry. Of course, I asked her, What? And at first she started counting down, very slowly. Then she whispered, Run. That's when I started sprinting up the stairs, crying my lungs out. And then she started running after me, trying to grab onto my ankles. I managed to make it inside the bathroom and lock the door. She was banging and screaming on the door like a crazy person. I have never been more frightened in my life. I stayed locked in there for what felt like hours until she stopped. My dad eventually got home and got me to come out. My mom was acting like nothing had happened at all. My mother is seriously mentally ill, but in a way that she has hid from most people beyond close family. My father worked nights, and my grandma, who lived in the same apartment complex, babysat me during the day while my mom worked and dad slept. One night after walking home from my grandma's, I came in to find my bedroom spotless. My mom had made my bed and turned down the blanket, having tucked my pajamas underneath as if someone were lying there. She had even wrapped the arm of my pajamas around my bear, She sat completely still and quiet next to my bed, holding one of my pajama sleeves. When she saw me, it seemed like she didn't recognize me. She said, Who are you? Playing along, I replied, Oh, it's just me. 
I should add that my mother was very cruel, both physically and mentally. She often gets this look on her face that is hard to describe, except to say that she is not there at all. My therapist calls it disassociation. This was the look she had that night, and being familiar with her abusive behavior, I turned on my heels, telling her I was going back to my grandma's. She beat me to the door, blocking it, and proceeded to tell me that she didn't know me, but I couldn't leave because she wanted to tell me about her real daughter. She then went into detail about how much I looked like her daughter, and how I was about the same age before she died. I was and am thoroughly convinced that if my father had not come through the door, she would have killed me that night. Until the age of four, I lived in an old, lower-income neighborhood that was in slow decline. The small house we lived in sat on a corner and had a rear detached garage. The side street was more of an alley and was mainly used for kids going back and forth between two streets. My bedroom window faced the side street and there were vines that covered more than half my window, but I could see through to the side yard and the street. One night, my mom must have forgotten to pull my shade, and I laid in my bed across the room looking out the window. It bothered me that the shade was up, and throughout the night, I would wake up and look. Each time it was the same. Vines, branches, and faint light from the corner street light illuminating the neighbor's fence across the street. At one point, I woke up and stared out the window for a long time. My brain finally sensed something was wrong, and my vision clicked into focus at one part of the vine covering portion of the window. There was a face looking at me through the gap in the vines. My four-year-old self suffered a silent heart attack as I clenched my eyes shut and moved under the blankets. I don't know how long I stayed like that, but sometime later that night, our doorbell rang. I heard it and jumped from bed and moved down the hall. I have an image of my dad standing at the door, saying, Who's there? At that point I told my mom about the face in the window. The police investigated, and they discovered that somebody had broken into our garage and tried to enter the house. As far as I know, they never caught the person, and my parents had no known enemies. So apparently some random stranger that was looking at me through my window that night, tried to get into our house for whatever reason. My family and I used to live in a rough neighborhood when I was a kid, seven years old. One night, it was just my mom, me, and my two siblings at home, and my dad was gone on a business trip. That night around midnight, someone started knocking on our front door. My mom woke up and went to the front door and asked who it was. No one answered. She thought that maybe it was some kids playing Ding Dong Ditch, so she went back to bed. About 30 minutes later, again, someone starts knocking. She gets up and peers through the side window to see if she can spot anyone out there. But nobody is there. She starts to worry, so she goes back into the room and grabs my dad's shotgun and sits in the living room in the dark, waiting. Again, there's knocking. My mom begins shouting at whoever was standing there that she was going to call the police, and if they tried to come in, she would shoot them. At about 2 a.m., the police finally showed up, and they did a search outside of our house while we waited inside. After their search, they tell my mom... They had found a piece of barbed wire about four feet long next to the front door and asked if it belonged to her. She said that of course it wasn't hers and asked why it would be there. The cop told her that it probably belonged to whoever was knocking on the door and he planned to wrap it around her throat when she opened. They said she was very smart to not open the door to see who was there, otherwise that could have cost her her life and ours. 
The cops said that they'd patrol the neighborhood until morning and do a thorough investigation once there was some daylight. That morning, as they were searching around the house, they found footprints leading around the back to the house leading up to my bedroom window. Part of my previous job's requirements involved doing bi-weekly inspections on HUD properties, vacant government-owned homes that we were contracted to list for sale. A lot of these properties were in pretty unsafe neighborhoods. One particular remains my least favorite house out of over 300 to this day. To start with, on my first visit, it was apparent something had happened in the house. Somebody had been making meth or something had gone horribly wrong. A fire had occurred, but there was no record of a fire with a previous insurance company. The neighbor said no fire had occurred, and the local fire department and police had never responded to a fire. I had a fair share of problems with broken windows, used condoms, the usual stuff you find in a neighborhood like this. Then, one afternoon, I pulled up in front of the house and started my inspection as I usually did, by walking around the house and going into the garage. Immediately, a car down the street started honking their horn. I thought it was weird, but this isn't the best neighborhood, so I just ignored it. This house had a garage that was built onto the back of the house, covering two bedroom windows. The windows looked down into the garage. There was no door from the garage into the house. In order to enter the garage, you had to go through the single door on the left-hand side of the property, towards the back. I should also mention that the heating system is such that the heat comes from the middle of the house through the big opening vent covered with a screen. The ductwork is gone, so when you look up through the vent, you can see into the crawl space. I go into the garage and notice the crawl space door is open. I look up and notice one of the bedroom windows is open. I stop. They should both be closed. I stand there for what feels like forever and contemplate calling the police. But I'm in a hurry so I just turn around, go back out the door, and lock it. I go into the front of the house. The car down the street is still honking its horn. I start my inspection as I usually do. Kitchen, living room, bathroom, bedroom number three, bedroom number one. And then I go to open the hallway closet between bedroom one and two. It won't open. I know I've opened it before. I'm turning the knob and pulling it, and it will not open. I start to get a really weird feeling in my stomach. The car outside is still honking. I step over the vent in the floor to go to bedroom number two, and I look down to see a pair of eyes looking back up at me. I look up, wipe my face, look back down, and they are gone. I ran, straight out of the front door, into my car, and locked my doors. The car had now stopped honking. This is what I think had happened. When I got to the house, there was two people inside. The person honking the car had warned them when I got out of my car. One of them had time to jump out of the window into the garage and then went into the crawl space. The other one only had time to get into the closet. When I ran out of the house, the horn stopped. They were signaling that I was leaving. I returned to the property two weeks later to find the windows shut. The crawl space door locked but a broken window. I did not enter the house, but I called the police instead. They found the closet door shut again, and four officers were unable to open the door. Upon my return two weeks after that, the door opened with ease. I'm convinced that someone was in the house with me on many of my visits. I just didn't know it. A few years ago, my friend convinced me to get a Tinder account. I had been single for about a year and a half after finally getting out of a three-year abusive relationship. But that's a whole other story for another day. So I decided, why not? I'll make the account, and if I don't like it, I'll delete it. What harm could it do? Little did I know. I was blown away by how many guys messaged me. I think we have a hard time admitting that it's a bit of a confidence booster. 
Anyways, I've been talking to this one guy that I found very attractive, and we seem to have a lot in common. So finally I agreed to meet up with him, but only if it's in public. So after a bit of back and forth, we agree on him coming to my work during lunch and just hang out for a bit. I was currently working at a grocery store deli, and I was back taking orders and helping customers when about 45 minutes later, I noticed a man staring at me. He was wearing sunglasses, which already made him stand out since we were inside, and I automatically knew it was him. I wasn't sure what to do. It kind of seemed like he wanted to stay hidden from me. Do I call him out and say hi? I ended up just ignoring it and justifying it as he was probably just coming in to make sure I was who I said I was. But looking back, that's just giving myself too much credit. I'm no model or anything like that. I'd say I'm average looking and on the chunky side with some confidence issues. After he left, I thought maybe he didn't like what I looked like in person and that's why he came in to check me out first. But I now know better. So about two hours later, he texts me, I'm outside. And I reply that I'm just clocking out and I'll meet him out front. It was the same guy as before, just without the glasses this time. I didn't bring it up or tell him I saw him earlier. It just felt kind of awkward. I always seem to give people the benefit of the doubt and try to justify their actions. Lunch went really well and I really liked him. So I ended up just forgetting about the earlier situation. I told him that I wanted to take things slow and he seemed totally okay with it. We both really liked the Utah Jazz so he invited me over to his house to watch the game after I got off work. My coworker and friend told me they had a bad feeling about it, but I just told him, I'll be fine. I'm a big girl. We both laughed, and then I was on my way to his house. When I got there, he told me he had a roommate, but he wasn't home, so it would just be the two of us. The night was going very well, until he said he needed to go to the bathroom. Before I go any further, I need to explain his living room a little. Right when you walk in, the TV is near the front door. The living room and kitchen didn't have a wall between them. It was just one big open space, and the couch was placed in between, so it wasn't against any wall. Sitting on the couch, you're facing the front door, and the kitchen is behind you. I hear him open the door, and I continue watching the game. I feel him come up behind the couch and put his hands on my shoulders, down to my hands, and he lifts them behind me. I thought he was just goofing around, so I went with it until he starts making my hands go lower when I suddenly feel his junk. Shocked, I bolt up, turn around and see him butt naked, fully erect, with the most serious face. His bright blue eyes just slicing into me. I felt dread. All I could think to say was, Uh, what are you doing? Not changing his expression, in a monotone voice, he replies, What do you think? Uh, I just came here to watch the game and hang out. You don't just come over to a guy's house you meet on Tinder, not expecting to hook up. Shock and disgusted, I reply. I made it clear. I want to take things slow. This is not slow. Fuming mad, he walked around the couch and started yelling at me, calling me a tease. At this point, I wanted to get out. So I grabbed my purse from beside the couch and started to walk towards the door. When he saw what I was doing, he ran up to the door, locked both the locks and stood there still naked and still erect, telling me I'm not leaving until I slept with him. Still in shock, I laughed thinking he must be joking. This went on for two hours. I would go to the door and he would push me away or grab the doorknob telling me no. I am now in survival mode, racking my brain on what I should do. My phone is dead and I don't know the area. It's been two hours and he's still not letting me go. I honestly felt like he was going to hurt me if I didn't do what he said. So finally I told him, Okay, but only if you let me go to the bathroom and freshen up. He had me go to his bathroom in his bedroom and said he was going to make us dinner and drinks, acting like nothing happened, like he just didn't spend two hours yelling at me, holding me against my will until I would sleep with him. I just sat in there trying to get my phone to turn on but knowing it was fully dead and I had no way to contact anyone for help. But that's when I remembered. 
when he was showing me his apartment. He showed me the balcony they shared with the neighbors. I put my ear up next to the bathroom door. I could still hear him in the kitchen. I opened the bathroom door slowly, praying he doesn't walk in or hear me coming out. I slowly tiptoe across his bedroom to the patio when I hear him yell, Are you kidding me? I felt my heart sink into my stomach. At this point, I knew I was caught. I slowly look up and I can see him through the crack of the door, walking to the kitchen sink with his finger in his mouth. He cut his finger. I got a boost of confidence and slowly opened his balcony door. Thank God it wasn't loud, but the confidence didn't last very long. I started thinking, what if he knows his neighbors and they don't help me? What if they're not home? What if I catch his attention and he pulls me back inside and God knows what happens to me? I took a deep breath and knocked on their patio glass door. It felt like forever and I finally heard someone walk up to the door. She looked through the glass, very confused. But once she saw my face swollen from crying and distress, she opened the door. Can I please walk through your house to leave? She seemed a little confused. So I said, please, I just want to go home, choking back tears. She guides me through her bedroom. I see a man walking into the bedroom, and I jump, thinking it was my date coming to find me. But as I look up, it's a 40-something-year-old man looking at me confused. Then the woman. She just nods and guides me out of the front door. She gives me a pat on the back, and I tell her thank you as I rush towards my car. As I'm at the bottom of the stairs, I hear a door open. I expect when I look back to see the woman, but it's my date. He's still naked, and once he sees me, he chases me. Now it's winter in Utah, and the ground is slippery from the ice but I don't care. I finally make it to my car. I get in, I lock the door, and I look up the front of his apartment. He's standing there on the top of the stairs, just staring at me, and he finally turns back around and goes inside. I guess it was too cold for him to chase me all the way to my car. I hit the gas and get as far away as possible. I don't want to go home, so I drive to my parents. I knock on my mom's bedroom window because it's about midnight now. I tell her everything and spend the night there. I ended up not calling the cops. I just didn't want to deal with it, which I regret to this day, because I don't want it to happen to another girl. But it's been so long and I don't want to go through it all, just for them to tell me it's not enough evidence. I know I made a lot of mistakes that night, but I am a completely changed person now, and that's why I'll never use a dating site again. For a bit of context, I grew up in the middle of a farmland in a large Victorian home. Given its story, it had always been several shacks and barns that once belonged to the builders of this house. There is a highway that sees maybe three cars on it during the night, and directly across about 200 feet inwards of a cornfield is a shack that I have always found creepy. As kids, myself and friends would dare each other to go inside and look which always ended up as us going in as team. Nothing scary was ever found. Maybe a few broken glasses, metal piles, and miscellaneous items. There was no electricity or any sort of utility that made it homely. Years go by and the existence of the shack becomes a part of my daily life. However, one particular night, I was watching TV. I had noticed a light going off and on outside my window. After getting startled, I dismiss it as passing cars, simply more frequent than they typically are. An hour passes. It's nearing midnight and the light stays on. This time I knew for sure it was coming from outside. My family was asleep, but being my pansy 16-year-old self, I needed confirmation. Too bad for me. Nobody wants to go check it out, so I go alone. I grab my pocket knife and a flashlight. The best thing I could think of with my shaken thoughts and take off into the night. As I near the highway, the lights turn off, almost making me choke on air, but I had to figure out what the hell was going on. I make my way into the entrance of the shack, which has no door, and I slowly begin to enter, my flashlight scanning the room for any signs of life. What happened next, I'll never forget. Five feet away from me, 
there was an old tattered recliner facing away that my father had tossed in there for future disposal. I shined my light on it because I knew I'd seen it rock ever so slightly. As I did that, a man stands up from the recliner, says absolutely nothing. All I could tell was that he was a middle-aged man and wearing a jacket of sorts. Before I could process what was happening, I was already sprinting across the road and praying he wasn't behind me. It felt like years before I made it to my door, but as I am about to make it in safely, I decide to look back. He was standing in the road completely still, no words whatsoever. It's been seven years since the shack still stands, the recliner remains in its place. My dad never believed me. I wish someone could share the dread I had when I realized the recliner was facing the window, which was directed straight at my house. So back in 2014, I was in a rush to move into another apartment, and there were not many available for the time frame I wanted it for, at least not any good apartments, and definitely not in any good areas. I finally found a nice, decent apartment with three rooms and moved in for the time being. At least I had a place to live while looking for a better place. The suite was newly renovated, so I was supposed to get new appliances as well. There had been a mistake with the fridge and the landlord told me that they would replace it as soon as possible and I should be expecting it within the first two weeks of moving in. About a month later, I got a knock on the door. I went to look through the peephole and saw a man standing there with a piece of paper in his hand and another man behind him. Fridge, the man said behind the door. I opened the door and saw two men. The first man was the delivery guy. Behind him stood a man who really didn't care about his appearance and honestly looked like he just crawled out of a dumpster. I thought he was just a helper. I let the man aside and he placed the refrigerator in the kitchen. The greasy man followed him inside and introduced himself to me. I am the new landlord, he said with a smile. Really? Where did the other one go? I asked. I was a bit startled as he looked like a freaking homeless guy. Who the hell would hire him? Oh, she doesn't work here anymore, he said. Well, no shit, I thought. The delivery guy then said bye and left, but the landlord didn't. Where are your parents? He asked me. I told him I lived here alone. Big mistake. No way. You look like a 15-year-old girl, he said with a smile. Haha, I get that a lot. What do you need a big place like this for? He asked. I just told him I was moving in temporarily. He walked over to the kitchen and started opening and closing the fridge door. Just checking if everything's good, he said. I just nodded and leaned against the wall and watched. He then stood there, looking at the fridge and then back at me. Why doesn't this guy just freaking leave? I thought to myself. Then he said, You're really cute. Look at you standing over there. You are so cute. I let out a laugh and thanked him. No red flags yet. He then said, I live on the first floor. If you want to come visit, we can hang out. I didn't know how to answer him. Um, haha. Yeah, I mean, I don't think... But before I could say another word, he interrupted me. I have no friends, and I don't talk to my family. I'm really lonely. Okay, red flags are going off now. I asked him why he didn't talk to his family, but he brushed it off and changed the topic quickly. Then he started walking to the door and repeated himself once again. Don't forget, first floor, don't be a stranger. I followed him to the door and locked it when he left. I felt a bit uncomfortable, but soon forgot about it. About three days later, I got a phone call from a place I applied to. I landed a part-time job at Best Buy. This was my second job since I already had a job at an insurance company. I was excited to start at Best Buy. I was hired in the tech department, and I loved computers. Before I go on, I worked Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 at the insurance place, and then three days a week at Best Buy, mostly in the evening, but it varied on weekends. So on the first day, I headed out of my apartment, took the elevator down, and was about to exit the front door when I heard a familiar voice. Hey. It was the landlord. Hey, what's up? I said. Nothing much. Where are you going? He asked. I ignored the question 
and told him I needed to go and walked out the door. I didn't need to drive to work because Best Buy was walking distance. About three minutes into my walk, I noticed a gray car drive slowly beside me. I glanced over to see who it was, and it was a landlord. He rolled the passenger side down. Where are you going? I told him I was on my way to work, and I was going to be late if I continued chatting. I said bye and continued to walk a bit faster. Wait, let me take you to work. Where you work? No, it's alright. It's not far away. I work at Best Buy. I'll walk. I know. Another dumb mistake. I shouldn't have told him where I worked. Come on, let me take you. I'm heading to Tim Hortons anyway. Need to get some coffee. Well, it wouldn't hurt if he dropped me off. I thought. He's going in the same direction anyway. I hesitated a bit, but then accepted the offer. I got into the car. I know again. Dumb of me. And let him drive me to work. It was a very short ride. But he did not fail to make me feel uncomfortable. When I finally got to my work's parking lot, I thanked him and reached for the door to open it. But it didn't open. Hey, your door is locked. Oh, haha, I have a habit to lock doors. Before I let you go, can you give me your number? I lied to him and told him my phone wasn't working and that I was just using my iPod. My phone wasn't on vibrate and I was hoping to God I wouldn't get a text message or any other notifications. Okay, then let me give you my number, he said. He grabbed a piece of paper and wrote his number down. Give me a call, okay? (laughs) Ha, sure, I said. When you gonna call me? He asked. I don't know. I'll call you when I get a chance to, I told him. What time are you done? I'll pick you up. I don't know. It's my first day. I don't know how long I'm gonna be here for. I was hoping he would fall for my lie. He unlocked the doors and I stepped out of the car. I thanked him again and walked towards the store. Before leaving, he once again shouted, Don't forget to call, and drove off. Jesus. What a creepy guy he is. I threw the little piece of paper out and forgot the whole situation again. The next day I was too scared to take the elevator since he always happened to be everywhere I was going. So I decided to take the stairs. It led to the back door and I was sure I wouldn't see him. I did this for about four days and never saw him. Great, this works, I thought. On the fourth night, I was sitting in the living room watching YouTube videos on my laptop. It was around 10.30 p.m. and I was kind of dozing off when I heard a knock on the door. I wasn't expecting anyone. Who could it be? I sat there quietly and did not move, hoping that they would just go away. Another knock. I tiptoed down to the door and looked out the peephole. It was a landlord again. Hey, you there? Open up. Confused and tired, I opened the door. The conversation went as followed. Hey, what's up? Where the hell have you been? What do you mean? I don't see you leave for work anymore. Did you quit or something? No, I still go to work. I just have a weird schedule. You never called me. I was waiting for your call. You never called me. You promised. Sorry, I just never got a chance to. I work two jobs and I'm pretty busy. I came to your work and asked for you. And they told me no one by your name worked there. Did you lie to me? Did you lie to me about your name? I was caught off guard. I didn't know what to tell him. I had indeed lied to him about my name. But that wasn't what freaked me out. Why the hell would he have gone to my work? You you, you went to my work? Why? I asked a bit nervously. Because I didn't see you around. I wanted to know where you were. He said irritated. I didn't respond. He just stared at me for a moment, hoping that I would invite him in. But there was no way in hell I was going to invite this guy in. I'm I'm really tired. I need to go to work tomorrow. I'll see you around. Look, I need to talk to you. Can we talk? Honestly, I'm tired right now. Can this wait? Whatever, fine. He said while walking away, still muttering something under his breath. I shut the door and stayed up for a bit, afraid that he would return. Luckily, he did not return and I could finally go to sleep. So the next day came. I got ready for work again and decided to take the elevator. The elevator door opened and guess who was there? Yep, it was him. 
He asked me if I needed a ride to work. I responded, No. Are you sure? He asked. I told him once again that I didn't need a ride, and I got out of the elevator and went to work. This went on for months. By this time, I had already mentioned him to my manager and co-workers. They just told me that if I didn't show up for work one day, they'd call the police. Sometimes he'd see me walk out of the main door, and he would just drop everything he was doing and come after me, asking me if I needed a ride. Other times he'd ask me if we could hang out, and if he could take me on a date. Knocking on my door in the middle of the night was a pretty common thing. One time, he was in the middle of a conversation with another tenant. The tenant was complaining about something that had broken and that he needed it fixed. The landlord told the tenant that he should go to his apartment and he would get his tools and follow quickly after. The tenant left, but he never went to go get his tools. Instead, he followed me outside and offered me a ride to work again. I told him no and that he needed to do his job and help the tenant. He said he didn't give a shit about the tenant. He just wanted to be around me. This creeped me out, of course. My manager had given me permission to go to the back room to get out of sight whenever he came in and looked for me, which he had done several times while I was at work. I caught him walking in once, scanning the entire store to see if he could spot me, but luckily he didn't, so he just left. He also mentioned once to me that he wanted to kidnap me. He told me he just wanted to take me away and keep me to himself. I remember when he said it. He looked like he was hesitating, as if he was going to act on it right away. I found it really alarming, but I wasn't too scared. I don't know why. I guess I didn't realize how much danger I was in at the time, which is odd. But I did play it cool, in case he was really going to try to do something. Now you may ask why I never called the police. Well, the police wouldn't have done anything since he has not caused any physical harm, so there would be no point in calling them. Also, I had no real proof that these things were happening, or any of the things that he said to me, other than him showing up to my work a few times. He continued to come to my work often to look for me, and if he didn't see me, he would leave, or he would bang on my door in the middle of the night, asking me to open the door. I, of course, would now just ignore it. He had no way of reaching me anymore, because it was now clear to him that I was avoiding him. A couple of weeks passed and I was awoken by the sound of the fire alarm going off. Oh shit, that's right. There's supposed to be another fire drill today. It was my day off. I quickly went to go see if I still had the note to see what time they were going to enter my apartment. Maybe I still had time to get ready and leave the apartment since the landlord usually comes with the person who checks the alarm. I couldn't find the note. I got ready as fast as I could and I was halfway done when I heard a knock on the door. Crap, I thought. I opened the door, and there was a guy for the alarm, and the landlord. They both walked in. The landlord didn't say a word to me. Guy checked the alarm and said it was good, and they both left. I felt relieved. That went well, right? Wrong. Not even a minute passed, and I heard another knock on the door. Hey, it's me. Can you open for a second? I ignored it. He knocks louder. Hey man, I know you're still in there. Stop playing with me. I need to tell you something. Come on, open up. It continued for about two minutes. Then it finally fell silent. I had enough of this fucking guy. I had to do something about this. That night, I was supposed to go to my friend's house to hang out with her and also return her laptop. I got ready and left my apartment around 11 p.m. It was really nice out. It was a long walk, but I really loved walking. I took the elevator down, and when the elevator door opened, I saw him standing by his door. He hadn't seemed to notice me yet, so I acted fast. Either I go back into the elevator, or I sprint to the front door. In a split second decision, I went for the front doors, but sadly, he noticed me, and I heard heavy footsteps running behind me. Before I go on with the story, I want to say that when you leave the front doors, you see a big parking lot. So basically, the front door is pretty much the back of the building, and the back doors are the front. I know, it's weird. Anyhow, when I got outside, 
I ran halfway around the building. There was no one there. I stopped running and started walking again, but something inside me told me to keep running. Little did I know that the reason why the footsteps behind me had stopped was because he had gone back inside and went to the back door to catch me there. When I got to the other side of the building, I saw that he had made it halfway around the back side of the building. I started running again, and he started running after me. He chased me for about two blocks, where we both occasionally stopped to catch our breaths. I was close to the main road when I stopped running. My lungs were burning, and I couldn't run anymore. Whatever happened next, I had to fight. He caught on. Out of breath, he said, Stop. Stop, man. You're killing me. Stop doing this to me. I looked in shock. Didn't say a word. Still trying to catch my breath. Stop doing this to me, he said, letting out a small cry. For the first time, I saw a look of sadness mixed with anger. Stop following me, I yelled. What the hell do you want? Don't go. Please come with me. Let's talk, he pleaded. Talk about what? He was still trying to catch his breath. I didn't care anymore. I was shaking, tired, and I just wanted to see my friend. I didn't even make out what he said because of all the adrenaline. I started walking again, turning around every two seconds to see if he was following me, but he wasn't. He just watched me walk away, and this is the last time I ever saw him. This happened earlier last year, and it still messes me up if I think about it too much. First, a little backstory to explain. I'm a delivery driver for Uber Eats, and I've been doing it as a side gig for the past year or so to earn some extra money. Uber Eats is a super chill job, although the pay definitely is not ideal, especially at night. Normally, any pings I get after 10 p.m., are just shitty fast food orders to customers where the chances of being tipped are even lower than they already are, which is low. I would say 2 out of 10 people tip, but whatever. Anyway, late night deliveries are rarely profitable, which is why I barely do them. However, on this night last year, there was a bonus going on. Reach 15 deliveries in a certain time frame and get an extra 75 bucks. Music to my ears. When that's the case, Late night deliveries rock because there's no traffic and it doesn't matter where you picking it up from. McDonald's, McDonald's. Bring on the bonuses. The faster you can get them done, the faster you can go home and knock out. Open roads all the way. Works for me. I was on a roll and finished my last Mickey D's run at 2.30 in the morning. Cashed my bonus and called it a night. For context, this took place in downtown San Diego. Downtown SD has fun restaurants, clubs at the core, but as you branch out, it gets more seedy. Once you get past 16th Street, it really gets sketchy. Lots of homeless camps, the works. I actively try to avoid this area, but in order to get back home on the freeway, I had to pass through that neighborhood. One more piece of info. I drive a 2002 shitty Ford Focus and nothing's automatic. In order to roll the window up or down, you have to reach over and crank the lever. Because it's a hassle to roll them up and down manually each time, when I do deliveries, I usually just keep both my windows down because it's easier to pick up delivery through the windows. This night, I had my windows down as usual. I was planning to roll them up before I passed 16th Street where the homeless camp was, but I didn't get that far. As I turned down the street heading towards the main drag, up ahead I see a man with one of those reflective construction vests standing on the side of the road. There's always some sort of construction going on downtown. It's pretty common for it to happen at night, so I didn't really pay much attention. As I get closer though, the man runs in the middle of the street, waving his arms, signaling stop. I slow down, thinking he's going to direct traffic, or reroute me, or something. I brake to 10 miles per hour, then 5, leaving distance trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. He breaks out into a jog towards my car and stops directly in front of it, blocking me and my car from moving forward. Immediate unease. This is weird. I'm wishing my windows were rolled up. It's 3 a.m. on a dark street and there's not a soul around except me and this dude. 
People talk about fight or flight, and I've always wondered how I would react in a situation that warranted a similar response. Now I know. My reaction was to freeze. Because I was slowing down, it hit me five seconds later than it should have. This guy is not a construction worker. He has on a hard hat and a vest and the creepiest smile I've ever seen in my life. At first I thought he was just smiling to be friendly, but smiling to acknowledge someone longer than a few seconds is super unnerving. Try it right now. Count to five seconds in your head while grinning and you'll see what I mean. That's what this guy was doing. Now he's just in front of me and I can tell he's homeless. That or just, I don't know. Older guy. I would guess 60s, but homeless has a way of making everyone look old, so who really knows? He's just staring at me, wild-eyed and smiling, all teeth. His smile and mannerisms, the best way I can describe, is twisty from American Horror Story. Literally though, this guy looked insane. I obviously should have reversed, but my brain was panicking and I didn't think that fast. I'm frozen in my car thinking, this is how I die. The whole time, he's not saying anything, just leering. Then like a ninja, he jumps onto the hood of my car and slams his fist against my hood. I am frozen in terror, just watching this guy. He starts pounding on the hood of my car, crawling around on his hands and knees, not saying anything, just crawling and staring at me. That's the most terrifying part. He never broke eye contact once during all of this, and he never stopped grinning. The thought of my window being open made me want to throw up, but at the same time, breaking eye contact and moving to roll it up felt scarier. Like if I made any sudden moves or looked away, he would try to come inside the car. He never said a word. I think it would have been less scary if he had said something, but he didn't. Just pounded his fist on the car and stared. In all reality, the whole encounter probably only lasted 15 seconds but it felt like days. I am freaking out, and before I can gain any sense of doing anything remotely intelligent, I see headlights in my rearview mirror coming up behind me from down the street. This man sees them too, and in an instant, jumps off my car and breaks off into a run behind me, heading towards a new car. Jesus Christ. I floored and don't look back until I'm halfway home on the freeway, and at this point, it's all adrenaline. For a long time after that, I stopped delivering at night, and I sure as hell don't go down that section of downtown anymore. I take the longer route home. I don't drive with the windows down at night if it's an area that's even remotely run down. What I realize from this is how naive I can be to just automatically trust, obey someone just because they have a uniform. Like, I didn't even question slowing down at first. The opposite, actually. In my mind, I was comforted by the fact that someone trustworthy was on the road. Subconscious thoughts went like, Oh, nice. A public servant doesn't want me to make a wrong turn. By the time I stopped it, it would have already been too late if this guy wanted to attack me. I shuddered thinking about it. I calmed down eventually by reassuring myself that it was probably just a crazy dude on drugs who meant no harm. Which... Hopefully was the case, and for my own peace of mind, I'm going to believe that it is. But what got me is the fact that the guy was dressed as a road worker, on a road, and deliberately behaving at first in a way to lead me to believe he was one. Why else would he wear that getup? Why are you trying to pull over cars? Just to freak people out? I don't know the answer, and I'm glad I didn't find out what it was that he wanted from me. Let me start by saying, I was a 19 year old female at this time. Still female of course, just a little bit older. I love camping. Anytime my friends and I come home from college, we would load up a cooler of beer, grab some gear, and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends would ever want to go, so I suffered from withdrawals from camping. One day the weather was way too nice to waste, so I grabbed some of my gear. I hopped in the car I borrowed from a buddy and drove to a spot in a secluded yet safe distance from civilization. 
Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but the creepy feeling is also somewhat a plus for me. It's the same reason people read these stories. It's fun to be scared. So I make up a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't brought much to eat, but I was enjoying myself, reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I got the feeling I was being watched, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I heard a twig crush over my right. Then I see a doe bolt from 100 feet or so in front of me. I laughed at myself and went back to the camp with an armful of wood that I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside of the ring of light cast by the fire. I always get inside my head, so I shrugged it off and kept whittling a stick I had been messing with. Around 1am, I decided to go into my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beers in the most unladylike fashion and smoking cheap cigars. Another reason why I like camping, I can act however I want, so I passed out pretty quickly. About 2am I start hearing footsteps. They sound pretty light and sort of timid. I think to myself it's just a deer or some other animal. Most likely a raccoon because I possibly left food out. I'm still on guard though. About 30 minutes of sleeping with one eye open I hear a rubbing noise. And the tent fabric being pushed in a bit. I don't know how I didn't shit my sleeping bag. But I just sat there paralyzed with my K-bar in hand. I desperately wanted to thrust a knife through the tent fabric, but I was still holding out hope that it was just some of my buddies from my frat joking with me, and then, as steadily as it began, it stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure, because daylight would be coming in about two to three hours, but I sure as shit wasn't going to sleep. All of a sudden at four o'clock I realized I should put my boots on, so that if anything happened I would be ready. After staying up and keeping alert for a little while, I hear my friend's car alarm blaring. I freak the hell out and run out of the tent. I got two steps out before something grabs me around the mouth. I open my mouth and scream, but instead the person's finger slips between my teeth. I heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have huge adrenaline rushes. In my case, I clamp down. And there's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous, but his finger popped off. He screamed and pulled his hand away with a missing digit falling on the ground. He took off running to the hill I was camping on and took off in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to the people whose house I ran to. A little scrawny girl in the wife beater, boxers, and steel toed boots. I also had blood that oozed down my lip from the finger. But because I had also managed to take a pretty big chunk out of my lip as well, I told them what happened and they called the police and got me some real clothing and the man of the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there, they checked it out. They brought me back to my friend's car, and what I saw just made me more scared. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire. The finger was also gone, suggesting he had came back. The kicker is, they never caught the guy. So somewhere out there, there's a man sitting down to dinner, maybe alone, maybe with a wife and couple of kids, and he's missing his right pinky. My husband and I moved in together almost four years ago to a rather nice, albeit expensive apartment complex in a sort of nice part of town. We were on the third floor with a large balcony that looks out onto the courtyard in which other apartments in the complex are located. Basically, you can see the other balconies and living rooms of the other tenants and open stairwells. A year went by without a hitch. My husband works at a bar so he comes home late while I usually make it home around 5. It is easy to get into any apartment doorway as the complex is large and open with no security doors except the door to the apartment. This all started in August of 2016. I would be home after work chilling and watching TV. Almost always around 9.30 I could hear someone come up the stairs. Things would be quiet, and all of a sudden, loud sharp knocks on my door. I didn't move because it was startling, 
but eventually went to look at the people. There stood three people, all with black hoodies on, all seemingly staring at the people like they could see me. I did not answer the door, and after a while they left. Cue to a few weeks later, same time, but in this instance, footsteps and then loud hard bangs on the door sent my cat flying to hide. I sat frozen, but said to myself, maybe it's the police. I made it to the peephole, and once again, this time, staring out at one person, dark hoodie, male, white, and very, very gaunt with huge black eyes. Again, I did not answer the door and grabbed a kitchen knife that I kept by my side until my husband came home. This continued for a few weeks, and once my husband was home, he proceeded to look out the people, saw the same man, and screamed for him to leave. And he did. We called maintenance and the police who both stated that they would do regular patrols. Everything stopped for a while, maybe six months during the winter, which helped me be at ease, because when all of this was happening, I was having a very hard time sleeping and stopped going out at night. However, I assume the same man started up again, except this time, the same large bangs on the door would happen, but when I would look out the peephole, nobody was there. I then became horrified as I started to notice extinguished cigarette butts by the side of my door, like someone was standing and waiting. I again reported it. Security stepped up in the area, but I still did not feel safe. I was just hoping it would just stop as I felt tortured in my own home. But as I realized two weeks ago, things could be much worse. At night, when I would go to bed, I would have to cross our eating area, which was right in front of our giant glass sliding door that led to our balcony. It was late at night, lights off in the apartment. As I walk by, I glance over and across the courtyard, I see the same man standing on the landing of the stairs across the way from the second to the third floor, staring right at my balcony. He was just standing there, unmoved, facing in the direction of me. It was the same man at my door. I immediately went numb. My heart was racing and I was chilled to the bone. I knew he couldn't have seen me because all of my lights were off, but I was still scared shitless. I called my husband who rushed over, but the man had left. We filed more reports to the front office and were promised more security patrols. This same man continued to stand at the stairway, just staring into my apartment, and it has now been two weeks, and he does this every Friday. I am literally horrified and have been having awful nightmares about someone breaking in and strangling me in my sleep. I used to live in a townhouse by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There was often commuters who parked outside my place and passed by through the day and night. Occasionally I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front porch. I even had my next door neighbor's ex-boyfriend come to my door telling me he had a hitman after him and he had a gun. But none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors and I would take him out for a walk before bed. My backyard light was broken and was too high up to change the light bulb so I always took him out to the front. That night, it was around 11 p.m. and I took him out to the front. It was a hot summer night and I was standing on the footpath when I suddenly saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere, a man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was from the outside of a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there 
and I thought maybe he was going to try to steal stuff, so I kept looking down the road to where he had gone. He had turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching, and then suddenly I see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gives me the absolute creeps, so I grab my dog and we go inside. I turn off all of my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom, which is in front of the townhouse and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch of my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony, and like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He's moving towards the house across the road, and then I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment, and then there he is. But he's not just there, he has stopped at the top of my driveway. I kid you not, his arms were out by his sides, and his legs apart in an unnatural stance. It was like he was preparing for something, like he wanted to kill me. My heart is racing so hard I can barely hear. So I'm standing there slack-jawed, looking at this would-be assailant when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and the window further opening it, and I see this person. This man is looking up towards me. I'm thinking surely he sees me. If he does, this does not stop him. He starts walking down my driveway, completely fixated. I then lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes are watering in fear and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do, so I go and sit on my bed, pick up my mobile phone, and dial my dad who lives in a suburb away. He answers, and I whisper to him what's happening, and he said he'll be there as soon as he can. I lie down in my bed and lie as still as I can, tears rolling down my cheeks. This feeling was pure fear. I did not know what this man was doing downstairs and if he could get in. What if I hadn't locked the doors? And then it dawned on me, why am I lying here in the dark crying? Turn on a light. And so I did. What seemed like a lifetime, but was probably just a couple of minutes, my dad finally arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia, so no guns, but he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched outside for the man. The man was gone. Maybe me turning on the lights scared him off. I then called the police, who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have. I don't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog, but they didn't find anything. I don't know what he wanted, but for a good year after that, I was so scared living there. So I have quite a creepy story for all of you. It's been roughly a month since the first incident, and it's been a doozy. I live in a small, shitty town in a big, beautiful state called New York. I reside in a two-story apartment with a front and back door. One Saturday night, I had a craving for a midnight snack, so I strutted down the stairs in my Saturday night apparel and into my kitchen. I was barely paying any attention to my surroundings until I noticed a face peering through my kitchen window. I went cold. The only way in was going around my house into my backyard, so this dude must have taken quite a few wrong turns. The man was just peering straight through me. His eyes did not move, but he just stared. I held eye contact for about 12 seconds until I could finally stammer something out. Hey, you need something? Silence and he just continued to stare. Buddy, do you need help? Still silence. 
That's when I immediately booked it upstairs to find some sort of weapon just in case he makes some rash decisions. By the time I make it down the stairs, armed with a baseball bat the size of my forearm, he had vanished. I look out the side window into the driveway that leads to the backyard, and there he is, stumbling like a drunk through the driveway. He seemed to be holding something. It was a knife, and I'm talking a big pocket knife. I'm about two feet away from this psycho, separated by a small window. I promptly turned white and closed the blinds. This guy didn't even turn to look at me, he just kept walking. Oh, but that's not the end of the story, not by a long shot. The next night around 8.30, the doorbell rang. Shaken up from last night, I peeked through the curtains to see who was there. As I peered out, I quickly realized I was peering right into the eyes of the lovely man who had visited me the night before. We were both one inch away from the glass, and it got real intimate. After slamming the blinds closed, I debated calling the police. After a few seconds, however, he just left. After that, I would receive the same strange visitor at random hours of the night, and from then on, would call the police each time he decided to show. It's been a while since the last incident, but I'm not very optimistic. This story took place sometime in the late 80s. So one time I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I haven't been to too many bars up to that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already drunk when we got there. When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came and talked to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace, and I noticed that she had really bright red hair. I assume she dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. Anyways, this girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell my friend was already very drunk. To be honest, I played along like I was drunk already too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks, so I told her we didn't have much money. She offered to buy us drinks. So, she kept buying us drinks, and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom. Before he came back out, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was beyond intoxicated. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it, he could barely answer her. I told her he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I really didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. Candace kept pushing it though, saying that she would take care of him, but I told her no because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him, and he was my responsibility. I told her the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed that she thought I was jealous, or that I was cock-blocking him, but my friend could barely stand and already lost interest in Candace. She immediately started to flirt with me and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and said that we could go to her place alone. At this point I had a few drinks, and I was pretty buzzed, so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her car. Wow, you're pretty drunk, huh? She said smiling as she held onto my arm. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening too easy for me, so I guess I felt uneasy. We got in her car and we drove down the street. Want to stop at the liquor store and get more to drink? I'll buy it she offered. I really didn't want to drink any more than I already did. 
I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the night. Sometimes I make myself look stupid when I'm drunk, so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candice more than I already did when I told her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough, but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame, so I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed she wanted to drink more also, and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. On the car ride, we passed the bottle back and forth, but she took tiny sips. I tried to take tiny sips, but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink more. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice and pretended to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know I was acting drunker than she actually believed, so she actually believed I was sloppy when I was simply buzzed. I took a couple more sips of liquor and finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride, I called her the wrong name a couple of times to get a reaction out of her. She didn't react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. For some reason, I thought she lied to me about her name initially. That's when we drove up to her house. I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She opened her front door, which was unlocked and we walked into her house. She closed the front door, then locked it. I thought that was really strange, but just assumed she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had to use the bathroom, so I walked into her bathroom, locked the door, and looked in the mirror. I felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make some noise and made myself puke up the liquor I drank. So I flushed the toilet and went to the sink and started drinking tap water out of my hands to sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk anymore, but I still wanted to hook up with Candace, so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned the sink off and I could hear her talking to someone. He's drunk as hell. He can barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to? And do what? I walked out of the bathroom and into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head, that very strange bright red hair, go into another room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey, where are you going? I slurred like a drunk. She walked back into the living room and up to me. Let's go into my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. That's when I realized it was another girl with the same wig on. She had changed it with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped, but I tried to look like I had no idea it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her and told her I just needed to use the bathroom one more time. It's fine, just hurry up in here, she said. So I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again, and this time I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to what exactly she said. Something sketchy was going on and I had to get out of that house. I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I ever have in my entire life. I didn't look behind myself for anything. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road and ran towards the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw CVS and I ran inside. I called a taxi and went home. I try to think what happened that night. What was she or they planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery, 
but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks, and even paid for my friend's taxi cab. And mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in that room they tried to lure me into? This happened about 10 years ago, in 2009. I was visiting my grandmother in a rural section of a lake of the Ozarks, near a small town with a hilarious name where I went to high school. I was very familiar with the area, and when visiting my grandmother, I would often walk into town, taking backwood trails until I reached the main road going into the town. Very rarely would someone stop and offer a ride, and normally, I would accept. It's a small town in a rural area where everyone mostly knows everyone else, so I wouldn't even look up until I was getting into the vehicle. I stopped accepting rides after this. I had just come out of the woods and was walking along the side of the road. I was still maybe a mile or two out of town and enjoying my walk. An older blue Ford Taurus pulls up next to me. The driver rolls down the passenger window. Do you need a ride? I suddenly hear and start to walk over. I get in and get a good look at my driver. The man looked like a greasier version of Charles Manson. Flat, stringy brown hair that looked like it hadn't been washed in over a week coming down to his jawline. He had a salt and pepper five o'clock shadow and wild blue eyes. Something about him rang every alarm bell in my body and I went to get back out of the car, but we were already in motion. Instead, I began to look around the vehicle. The front was pretty normal and even clean. The back seat is covered with a blanket. On top of the blanket is something that takes up nearly the entire back seat wrapped in a tarp. Whatever it is, it stands to about a foot and a half off the back seat. On top of all of this is a big black shaggy dog that is staring right through me. What are you doing here? The question snapped me back to the front seat. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, what? I ask. He's now staring at me instead of the road. I said, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm visiting my grandmother. I live in College Town about 90 miles from here, and I'm, uh, I'm on my way to see some old friends. He frowns. No. Why are you here? I frown a little. Everything is flashing red flags right now. I, uh, I just told you. I mumble. My tension is visibly rising. The dog gives a low growl from the back seat. We're now passing the sign for the country line. There's a gas station coming up that marks the beginning of the town. He is still staring at me. He screams out of nowhere, slamming his hands on the steering wheel. I'm now huddled against the door, shaking. He pulls into the gas station. Give me your glasses. That was a statement, not a question, and there was no emotion in his voice. Without question, I hand them over. You better wait here. He then goes into the store. I'm frozen in place, shaking and trying to will my arms and legs to work, trying to start breathing again. I know whatever the hell is going on, that I need out fast. The dog then gives another low growl, and that snapped me into action. I get up, almost rolling out of the car. I'm completely shaking, and I walk into the store and say to the guy, uh, This is close enough to where I'm going. I, uh, I would like my glasses now, please. My eyesight is very poor, but I could feel the intensity of the glare he gave me. I, uh, I think the cashier could too, because she took a couple steps back 
closer to the store phone. Silently, he hands my glasses to me and continues to stare daggers at me as I put them on. And then he walks out of the store without saying a word to either of us. The cashier stares at me, clearly freaked out. The adrenaline of the situation had started to wear off and the real gravity started to sink on me. Tears are now silently beginning to course down my face. Can I, uh, can I just use your phone, please? I ask her. She nods and hands it to me with a box of tissues. She tells me I can go into the manager's office to make my phone call and to take as much time as I need. I thank her, go back, and let my friends know what just happened. I also tell them I will be cutting through the woods to get to them because I really don't want to see this guy ever again. I took a few minutes to breathe and relax after I hung up. When I went back out, the cashier asked if I was okay and if there was anything she could do for me. I thanked her again and told her no. I asked her if she knew the guy and she said she has never seen him before and didn't think he was from the area. That literally shook me even more. I give her my friend's phone number and ask her to call them if he comes back. Then I left and cut through the woods to my friend's house. We had a great afternoon actually and when I was ready to leave, they gave me a ride home. At the time, it didn't bother me as much, but the longer I've thought about it, the more curious I am about that back seat. I try not to think about what was under that tarp. It just looked as if someone was laying in a fetal position underneath that tarp. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked into our rooms, and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine and I saw someone in the bathroom. I said, Hello? Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason, and then I saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, what are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. This woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and I said, What's in the bag? Thinking that it's probably my stuff. And so she said, No, no. It's just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. And so she did. I looked in the bag, and I didn't see anything of mine. And so since I'm obviously in shock at this time, I let her leave. I went into my room, and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went into the bathroom, and I saw my underwear, my bikini and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. Then I looked on the counter and I saw that she got into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at that moment other than I wanted it back. So I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out to the side of the hotel, but I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her so my coworker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what had happened, and then we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait, and I noticed that there was a metal bat on my bed, as well as a flashlight. She must have left it behind in her hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. 
I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought she had gotten away with my medication that I need. The police got there and they took our statements and looked around the room as well. The one thing that I noticed, there was bits of drywall in the sink and I pointed that out to the cops, but none of us really knew where it came from. We started to look at the door and the windows to see if she had pried her way in somehow, but there was nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something. Even though the hotel front desk was adamant, there was no way that could be. The officer that came then brought up two more officers as backup because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do. So they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people. And as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking about the drywall in the sink and it still doesn't make sense to me. So I'm on the phone and looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it. And then it hit me. I got my coworker and asked her to help me pull at this mirror on the wall. And when we took the mirror down, there was a hole just big enough for the desperate junkie to squeeze through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know what I have found. And my boss said, there's still two cops in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kind of rolled her eyes. But the young guy said, I'll come check it out. They both came back up, looked in the hole, and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for God knows how long. She had access to me and my room at all times. I know it might be hard to picture, but there was a crawl space about two feet wide in between the two rows of rooms. One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to him what was going on. He comes back, takes pictures, and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously, we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier, she has probably been there a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and I assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom and it was traveling through the vents. A junkie was smoking just on the other side of my mirror. She had access to other rooms too. The holes in the walls were from renovation and the hotel hadn't patched up the walls and just covered them up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone. When I was a teenager, I lived in a small town located about 30 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia. I didn't get my driver's license or my first car until I was about 20 years old. So between the ages of 16 and 19, I hitchhiked frequently. This was in the early 70s when people still hitchhiked and many drivers were still willing to pick people up in spite of the dangers and risks posed to both the driver and rider. For the most part, I never had any trouble with people who offered me rides, but occasionally, I would get picked up by someone who would totally creep me out. This is a story about one creepy ride I accepted, and how 25 years later, I would discover my great shock that I may have been much luckier at the time than I had ever imagined. This incident occurred sometime in the summer of 1974 when I was 17 years old. At the time, I was 6 foot tall, 175 pounds, blonde hair, and a blue-eyed guy who did not have any trouble connecting with girls for dates. In fact, my story begins with me standing on the side of the highway with my thumb out as I was trying to get back home after spending the weekend with my girlfriend who lived in downtown Atlanta. I was traveling south away from the city and out in the country where I lived with my parents. I recall that I only had my thumb out for about 15 minutes when a man in a big white Lincoln Town car pulled over. 
As I walked up to the car, I scanned the inside and looked at the driver, trying to size the situation up as I always did, just to be safe. What I saw was a tidy car with a man in the driver's seat who looked to be in his 30s or mid-40s, dressed in an expensive suit and tie. He had short black hair, wore black rimmed eyeglasses, and appeared to be on the thin side with a gaunt face and dark eyes. I never learned his name, but for the sake of this story, we'll call him Town Car Man. When I got to the passenger side of the car, I leaned down towards the open window and told him where I was heading to and asked him if he was going that far, to which he replied yes in a very soft voice and waved me into the car. I was not all that weary of him, as by all appearances, he was just an ordinary middle-class businessman and I opened the door and got in the front seat next to him without any hesitation. Generally, when I accepted rides from strangers while hitchhiking, I liked to try to be engaged in chat some sort of way to pay them for the ride by providing good conversation and also put them at ease about picking me up and showing them that I'm harmless and not a creep. However, when I began trying to chat with town car man in a normal fashion with typical small talk, I instantly started getting bad vibes from him as I could tell that he was mostly ignoring what I was saying and instead kept trying to steer the conversation towards asking me personal questions about myself, such as how old was I, where I went to school, if I had a girlfriend, etc. I tried to answer his questions politely as possible, without really giving too much information, but town car man kept getting more and more personal, asking questions that hinted at whether or not I was sexually active with my girlfriend, telling me that when he was my age, he went around horny about half the time and that he had always been on the lookout for sexual adventures and then he gave off this creepy laugh. As the ride progressed and we were going further and further out into the country, I began to feel very uneasy as I started to sense that something was not quite right with him. We had just left the populated city behind and were now traveling down an old two-lane highway through the countryside that was sparsely populated. There seemed to be hardly any other cars on the road. The more that town car man continued to ask me questions about myself, wanting to know very personal things about me, like if I had ever had sex with my girlfriend, all while glancing over at me from time to time with a sort of creepy knowing look in his eye, as if he was privately enjoying some dirty secret that only he knew about. It was then I became increasingly uncomfortable. I really don't know how to describe it. It just made me feel really uneasy, as his manner seemed very cagey, and I totally sensed that there was some underlying motive to his questioning. It really put me on guard. I began to think about what I should do next. Should I ask him to pull over and let me out, even though I was only about halfway to my destination and out in the middle of nowhere? For the first time in my life, I began to realize just how vulnerable I felt. What really made me start to feel uneasy was when he started asking me if I wanted a drink of liquor, indicating that he had several bottles with him in the trunk and that if I wanted some, he would pull over to the side of the road and mix me up a stiff drink. Because I was growing more and more uncomfortable, I declined his offer, saying that I did not drink which was a lie, even at that age. I was already drinking with friends. But that's when he would not take no for an answer and kept insisting that I should really just have one drink because he was such a great drink mixer and it would only take a minute for him to fix a very special one for me. After I declined this offer, for something like the fourth time, he abruptly changed tactics again and began telling me a story about when he was my age and a young guy in the army and how he used to hitchhike a lot too. He said he would sometimes get picked up by men who wanted to pay him money to have sex with them and if anything like that has ever happened to me. By this time, I had quite enough of all of this and I looked him straight in the eye and said, no, this has never happened to me and nobody better offer me that. 
instantly. That knowing look I talked about vanished instantly from his face, and I could tell that he was totally irked by how I reacted to his story. That exchange between us totally changed the mood inside the car, and he became very quiet. After a few minutes of this uneasy silence, he spoke up and told me that he was turning at the next intersection and that I would need to get out of the car. At this point, I was actually very relieved and couldn't wait to get out of the car. When the car came to a stop, I had just barely gotten out the car and pushed the door close when he stepped on the gas and zoomed off, literally jerking the handle of the car out of my hand. I remember I stood there watching him drive away until he had disappeared down the road and that my heart was beating very fast. After I had calmed down, I resumed hitchhiking until I got another ride that took me home without further incident. Fast forward 25 years. It's 1999 and I had all but forgotten about my creepy ride with Town Car Man. I'm on the internet reading through a true crime website when I stumble onto a story about an ultra creepy guy named Robert Bennett, a man who had been arrested after a series of vicious attacks on men who he had picked up, drugged, handcuffed, and then set their genitals on fire with flammable liquid. The attacks took place over a 20 year period, starting around 1968 in the Atlanta area and ending with his arrest in 1991. Prior to Bennett's arrest, this attacker became known as the Handcuffed Man and talk within the local gay community was that he was targeting men whom he thought were gay prostitutes. When I saw the photo of Bennett that accompanied the article, my jaw literally dropped open and the memories of my ride that day in 1974 came flooding back. I was certain I was looking at a picture of Town Car Man and I was absolutely floored. I don't have any way to prove that the creepy guy who picked me up was in fact this Robert Bennett, but the physical resemblance between what I remember about Town Car Man and the photo of Bennett is absolutely uncanny. Also, the persistent offer by Town Car Man to mix me a special drink and his questions about whether or not I have had sex with men for money also seems to indicate that possibility. I should point out that even though this story took place in the early 70s, in the deep south of Georgia, I was actually okay with gay people at the time, and even knew a few people back then who were gay, so I did not have a problem with homosexuality at all, and still don't. But being heterosexual, I also had zero interest in having sex with other men, and even if I had been game for that sort of thing, I always found it highly distasteful when people assumed that they could act in such an unwanted, cagey fashion regarding sexual matters with complete strangers. I always have, and always will find that to be extremely creepy. <laughs> 